Okay, so now we have we have about ten minutes or so for for discussion questions. So if um, if anyone's been holding back any questions, I'd I'd encourage you to type them into the chat now. I haven't seen any come up, uh, although I've been having internet problems as well. So uh, if I'm wrong, then um, please correct me. Does anyone have any questions? I mean, I have I have questions for each of you that I I could start by asking if uh, until other people chime in, I suppose. Um, I, I wish there was one question that I had in mind for everyone, um, but I don't think I, I'm quite that organized to get that. So I'll start, I suppose. Um, I'll start with Paul. Are you still here? Yes. Good. Um, so I, I was wondering, I mean, it, it was a great presentation of, of speckle viz uh, and the, the case studies in particular that were quite nice but but you you focused on um the the benefits at the point of design i would say in the, and it just led me to wonder um what about further on down the line in terms of construction and and, and post occupancy i mean one of the one of the advantages of, of the standard bim approach which just like uh, robert and i in our keynotes you're also taking a a, a different stance against is that particularly down the line the information that you have um in in the construction cases is very useful and i just wondered if you had a sense of whether there was a, a similar advantage in speckle and indeed the interface at those stages down the line uh yeah thank you for the question sean um yeah i i mean it was only thought for uh i would say early stage design and uh during during the the the, the design of the of a beam model so also late stages in terms of modeling but maybe not uh, it wasn't thought in terms of uh construction per se, uh, I think it's, to be honest, I think it's quite still a, a generic tools. It's not very specified to any particular phase. So I think there would be a uh, potential as well for uh, construction because in the end uh, you can, it just lets you explore uh, raw uh, data. Uh, I mean, data, rich data, but quite raw um, and, um, I mean, in terms of like the viewer interface, uh, for example, I know that Dimitri worked on the Arup Carbon uh, app that lets you um, uh, inform all the objects in terms of their uh, carbon uh, impact. Um, so, I mean, that would lean more towards uh, the construction stage, stage. So, I mean, short answer, yes, I think there is potential. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm still not getting any questions from the audience, so I'll I'll continue with mine and, and dominate the discussion here uh, until some other ones arrive. Um, I I suppose I'll move on to to Oliver's next. Um, th there were a couple of things that that I I found interesting here, but I, I was I was particularly curious about um, the obviously in your presentation you, you didn't uh, you, probably for. Um, uh, IP reasons, you weren't able to show exactly what all the features were that you looked at. But I, I get the sense it was primarily a case of uh, the, the, the actual physical structure and, and you know, elements like doors and windows and, and walls and so on that you're presenting. And I, I just, um, I was wondering, coming from a, a, a space syntax background, um, where our representations are primarily of spaces, I wondered if, um, if you had looked at other representations like topological representations of spaces, how the space is connected to one another, if you, if you compared those uh, in terms of their importance uh, or, or whether you get a sense of whether the particular type of representation you choose matters quite a lot in, in determining the, the kind of output you get. Um, this is partly in respect to some of the things that I was thinking about in, in the examples I showed, where uh, in classifying and clustering building types, no matter what, what uh, features we took, we always seem to get the same neighborhoods or the same um, uh, geographical classifications coming out of it. And I just wondered if you got the sense that that was the same situation in, um, in the apartments. So... Topology modeling is something that interests me an awful lot. Um, actually, Racine 
Can, can you hear me, first of all? Yeah. Let me just, okay. Um, Wasim taught me back in Cardiff, uh, back, in, back in the days when I was doing um, my undergrad. So um, I've been really interested to kind of follow its development and I see a huge amount of potential in it. I think it's, um, given the kind of background I've had in kind of modeling and sort of, you know, been brought up in a kind of a CAD and a BIM approach largely, it does seem it's a, not unintuitive, it's a kind of a new set of intuition to sort of understand space. But in terms of sort of, understanding a building as a, a network of connected spaces and sort of like adjacent edges I think there's an enormous amount of enormous amount of potential for that and actually I would really like to um, one thing I would love to do is be able to build an API if you like for our data set which would enable me to connect with other services things like Topologic for instance and Topologic probably would have made um, to an extent the comparison and the similarity analysis a lot more easy because perhaps an external wall might already know and it's, it's an external wall. I wouldn't have to kind of build my own custom algorithms to sort of figure that thing out uh, using kind of a brute force testing approach, if you like. Um, the space syntax, I kind of was able to sort of read a few of the initial papers, but actually I found it um, quite hard to um, jump into initially because I was looking at a bunch of different approaches and I kind of found I don't know if it's related to sort of shape-based grammars, but I, I, I jumped into the kind of the initial, the very early papers, and um, it was something that kind of I felt I needed more time to really focus on to really get to, to grips with. Um, so it wasn't an approach I considered, but I kind of I appreciate it's kind of it's very fundamental in sort of the, the history of sort of design comprehension algorithms and enable, enabling you to kind of you know um, an engineer that towards a particular task and optimize things. Hopefully, I've answered your question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, it was it was actually more uh, because I'm not sure exactly what what you have uh, modeled and what you haven't. It was more whether you got a sense of whether there was there was a, a significant difference between uh, those different types of modeling. But I, I'm guessing that it's uh, it's it's too early to tell that those are perhaps uh, additions for the future, and and we don't yet know what the results are. Okay. Um, Again, if anyone has any questions, I haven't seen any yet, but uh, but please do uh, consider typing them in. Um, I I'll, I'll continue. Uh, there are through. a couple actually, Sean. Sorry, oh, okay. did, um, did I? Did uh, sorry, I just, the, just the one them, from Christopher at uh, the bottom. Yes, the, uh, Sean. There are two dialogue boxes. Yeah, one for uh, conversation right. chat and one I for. Okay. Sorry, I've uh, I I've closed the other one because my screen is small and I missed it. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, this has a question for Julian. Uh, in coupling the design of form with the control of fabrication of a novel layered materialized, oh, sorry, monopoly material and its adhesion pro, could you elaborate on the challenges of a flexible or adaptable digital workflow that connects the material's final shape with the intended shape? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I get the question right. Um, let me just read it again. No, sorry, I I don't get the question right. I think I don't I, understand I, what, what it's going on here. Yeah, I may be interpreting this through my own um, take on it. I think I had a, I had a question that was a different question, but also related to this. I, I think okay. what Chris is getting at is is the um, the uncertainty of this type of material uh, and whether. There, there was, I mean, there were a couple of cases, obviously the, the method is still in progress, but you could see in the video that you had to hold, you had to manually <laughs> intervene in, in a few cases. So I, I think he asked it the, um, uh, the few of, of being able to, uh, what are the challenges in, in controlling for that unpredictability? If, if I'm wrong about this, then, then perhaps Chris can retype the question. Of this, of this unpredictability ability of of um of the material while printing or what do you yeah mean? i think so, or in general the, the entire workflow i mean you've got mm. you, you would also have um presumably the the form that you're trying to produce but that would also include various structural properties i'm sure as well which which obviously depending on how you layer and angle the fibers would change so that there's all sorts of level of of trying to meet your your final objective in this process um, yeah, Chris, you you, yeah, you can unmute yourself as well if you wish to speak. We just we just allow that. Oh, okay. 
So um, regarding um, the material and its problems while printing, um, yeah, obviously um, this is um, kind of first first test of of this approach of printing. And um, before this, we had um, we are uh, we are researching um, parallel um, in topology optimization of um, typical architectural um, elements like beams. So like you see in these, this big one on the wall behind me and the idea of um, this printing approach right now is that we are not just want to, um, to um, optimize these kind of beams and elements and also, but also give them um, uh, a solid shell that is um, not dependent on the material um, characteristic um, like a, it's straight um, application. So I don't know if this answers your question, but um, the um, um, the holding while printing with my bare hands is just the just the problem with the extrusion um, itself. And um, as you can see, it's right now in development, and we um, we are still making um, progress um, while printing this um, material in this way. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this is answers um, your question a bit. Uh, I, want, I, want to speak, <laughs> I want to speak for Chris. Um, yeah. Uh, unless he wants to, to ask uh, or chime in, I, I, he might be able to unmute his microphone. I mean, I could ask uh, maybe specifically about one aspect, which uh, I noticed. One of the things that you, you do is, um, is to obviously to mill down each of the fibers to the standard width. Yeah. Um, and obviously that, that makes it much easier to produce, but, but if we're talking about um, uh, sustainability and waste and so on, it looked like there's quite a bit of the willow that, that comes off in the milling process. I, I wondered, is, is there a future uh, in which you could deal with more of the material and allow for more variability between each of the fibers, um, that, that it would somehow adapt to that? Uh, and, and if so, is there likely to be a, a trade-off in terms of um, uh, poor structural performance, let's say, if, if, if the fibers are, are, are um, more variable? Are, are there trade-offs there that you'd have to negotiate? So, um, yeah, of course, um, if we um, cut down the material to a, a profile that we, are, that we can work with, um, you have um, some waste of material. But um, for this process, we actually need um, flat surfaces to bond well together. So this um, this kind of profile that I showed in the presentation is the is the minimum um, requirement for this process. So yeah, we have um, kind of um, yeah some waste in this process. But um, another department of this university is uh, researching right now um, what to do with this waste. So. If we can use it uh, in the compound material to bind um, the extrusion um, filaments together, or if we if we um, have, can use them for other things, or if they is just waste. Um, yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, I, the paper is called additive manufacturing. Um, yeah, we have some trade offs in in there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, yeah. I noticed that we are running slightly over time now. We've got a, another keynote in 45 minutes. So I suppose um, we, we do have to have this break for lunch. Uh, should, we, should we call it now and resume at 1.30? Yes, I believe so, Sean. I think it's a good idea. We'll also uh, stop uh, the call and restart the call at, uh, at uh, 1.30. So we can encode this video of the of uh, of this first session. So yeah, I, uh, again, I thank you all the presenters for the for the fantastic presentations. I was uh, I was very enthusiastic about all the papers, and I thank you very much for Professor Robert H and for Professor Sean Hanna to to open the conference and host this first session.